Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad, and today I'm very honoured to speak with none other than Patrick McConlog. Pat, thank you so much, mate, for coming on the channel today. Really, really uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Anytime, mate. So Pat, if you're not familiar, he is the co-founder of a very exciting up-and-coming blockchain architecture and design, and that is called Block Collider. So we're going to unpack it, we're going to explore it, and we're going to really just come to understand what is a very exciting uh, uh, multi-chain design. So Pat, let's talk about you first. You've done some pretty amazing things in your time. You have a background in computer science. Uh, you ha and you have had that for some time now. You're obviously quite young, but you've, I, I've read that you've been into the, the computer science field for, since you were very young. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. We'll find out more. But it also, in terms of security and cryptography, you have a special interest in that, and all of your experience comes from those fields. Uh, for the past four years, you've also worked in the technology field, which has put you in good stead, no doubt, for blockchain, being a technology in its own right and an industry. And uh, once again, you have your experience illustrates, uh, I suppose, an expertise in this area, given that you have already um, uh, signed off on two patents, uh, and you've also found means to leverage tech towards the freedom for all, as you say. So once again, welcome to the channel. Pat, can you tell us a bit about yourself just briefly? I really enjoy um, working on the things that I believe in. And what's interesting in this case is that there is a geopolitical shift going on in addition to a technological movement that directly uh, moves in line with what I think is the best just day-to-day uh, -day way for human beings to live, you know, mm -hmm. independently, without any tyrannical control, and in control of the things that you earned. Right. So you're really a, a proponent of change given the, the current model, the traditional models of control and centralization, essentially. Right. Awesome. So let's talk about your project now, Patrick. It's an exciting one. It's a mouthful when we explain it from the website. So let's unpack it. On the website, it says that you are essentially breaking, uh, let, me, let me be clear, it is a mineable multi-chain protocol for stablecoin decentralized exchanges and meta contracts. So that's quite a lot. Let's talk about that in, in the sense of multi-chain first. Why is, why is multi-chain so important and what essentially are you? So that's, that's a great question. So since 2016, there's been this enormous pressure building around the almost revelation that there's not going to be one of these things, but that there's going to be silos, powerhouses, you know, allocating technology and features to solve different problems. Hmm. And that pressure has, is, you know, you can start to see the cracks now, especially when exchanges lose hundreds of millions of dollars and people almost pass it off like well that's you know it's just what we're gonna have to deal with right and it's like that pressure um results in this question of how do we deal with multiple blockchains and how do we still resolve the fact that this blockchain technology has this premise of decentralization but then inherently right anytime you create a bridge there must be something supporting it mm -hmm. and Whenever that happens, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but it also means this enormous pressure gets unlocked into opportunity right. and the objective suddenly becomes very clear with the, the growth potential for the whole ecosystem if we can figure out how to work together. Mm -hmm. So in that context, I mean, obviously one of the key things, and there's a buzzword right now, is stable coins themselves, given that we've seen Tether, you know, rise and be an issue no doubt in stabilizing certain marketplaces. You are a pro protocol, I would imagine you're an agnostic one by design given you're bridging various blockchains. In So where, what is the role of the stable coin in your design? That's actually, that's a great point and it's cool that you're looking at that. I think stable coins are actually, you know, they're almost the undiscovered cool thing of the decentralized exchange vertical or conversation. Sure. Where everyone's looking at that and it's like, man, these stable coins are interesting. Mm. What the Collider does is it creates a method for you to, you know, go go as far as your creativity and technical prowess can take you. Mm -hmm. You can build assets that are based off of hash power. You can build assets that are based off of baskets of subsets of assets. You can design stable coins that rebalance based on block height, block speed, even like block difficulty, which is interesting. And we're not trying to put any of those in a box. Uh, we're hoping 
to build, well, we are going to provide several examples ourselves, just mm-hmm. so you can see, here's a strange asset that, you know, has stability components built in. Right. But we're looking a lot towards uh, Ethereum and the way that they've made it easy to launch tokens. Mm-hmm. We're going to make it easy to launch stable coins in lots of different varieties, lots of different kinds. Awesome. So in that respect, in terms of meta contracts, which is another part of your slogan, what role does that have and, and why the meta contract? So meta contracts are a fascinating, uh, like the last step. Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to always the hardest part. <laughs> I do, yeah. Meta contract, yes, is the, the lowest level you know, part of the collider. Right. And the meta contract is really a enhanced version of Bitcoin script. Mm-hmm. What happened with Bitcoin script is they had this moment where, oh my goodness, left shift op codes and right shift op codes exposed a vulnerability to an overflow attack. Right. And instead of just freezing those preemptively, they froze a bunch more. But in doing so, it made this timidity around some of the opcodes that are actually extremely useful. Okay. So what we did is we unlocked the ones that have now been since discovered are more stable. Mm-hmm. We've read those back to the traditional scripting language. Then we've enhanced it with 27 new opcodes. And before anyone in the programming sphere flips out that, you know, oh my God, we've added opcodes. We separated the compilation of these new opcodes into a subclass of the transactions operations. Okay. So they can be easily versioned, easily containerized, and of course, in that process, we can protect against gas attacks, transaction spamming, you know, whatever you want to call it. I see. So you've put quite serious preventative measures in, and you've allowed for flexibility. Let's talk about interoperability for a moment, because it's quite exciting. Essentially, that's one of your key premises for your design. And you've also advertised that you're going to integrate the use of very well-known blockchains right now. We're talking Bitcoin, Ethereum, Neo, Lisk, and Waves, and one very exciting other, let's say, which I'm hoping you know eventually to unpack with you at some point. But let's talk about the context of interoperability. So there are two parts to the interoperability space that I think I would want everyone to copy from us. Just copy, like we don't even care. You don't even have to reference it. These are just parts that I think should be a should be involved in any decentralized interruptibility play. Okay. The first thing is not only tokens. You need to be able to trade and move and interact with any kind of blockchain. Mm-hmm. And some of these solutions, I think, are maybe a killer team that, like, let's just take the last step and extend interruptibility. You know, and maybe there might be some political politics in here that I don't see. You know, where it's like we want you know just Bitcoin maximalists with just mm-hmm. Bitcoin. Just eat, guys, you know, whatever that is. But I don't think those should be there. And so, Block Collider's first, you know, paramount feature is that it is a an exchange of state or an exchange of data, mm-hmm. not just exchange of tokens. So, like things like Cosmos, Wenchain, OneChain, whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it. Each of those only trade and move tokens around, and that's not enough, especially not enough when you look at the blockchain ecosystem in terms of development. Right. We need to exchange the states between different chains and in doing so let you build these applications that include complex uh, multi-chain functionality the second big part is uh, no validators right validators are the worst right so th- it's, it's just something that i it's like an interim stopgap solution i keep calling them the they're like fiefdoms in the 1400s okay like it's like perhaps the, the duke again and that is not good for most people <laughs> like right one central authority with all of the money capable of, you know, proving whether or not you even have money. Mm. And that's just a horrifying thought that I, we should just delete it. So, so, essentially that, so essentially, you know, to hark back to your analogy of the garden, there's no kings in the court uh, and you're breaking down the walls of the garden, uh, as nice. you allude to, and you're trying to create essentially an open landscape. There you go. That's a much better way of so, like that. So let's talk about that in the context of DEXs, you know, decentralized exchanges. You know, obviously you're a proponent of those. So how, what's the role and what's the plan in, in relation to the, un, the unfolding of decentralized exchanges in the future? I, I think every single DEX programmer is working on some of the best code that they may ever write. Right. So if you're in a decentralized exchange right now as a programmer, the ecosystem has to thank you. What we want to do is help those programmers build even more and diverse decentralized exchanges. Like 
right now you can swap, you know, on Ether Delta, for example, we'd say is like, there's, that's the, the inkling of the smallest firefly of a spark right. of what a decentralized exchange could look like. Mm-hmm. With Block Collider, you can take your same smart contracts and upgrade their uh, ability, both in liquidity and in function, to, ex- to trade assets that are not necessarily tokens, but also to trade assets directly with your contract that may not even be assets themselves. We have to like, we have to now live in a world with crypto kitties. We have to get used to that world. Right. And there, are, there are fascinating things to explore in that space too. Absolutely. And you clarified, which is a very key point component of your design. You have no validators. You also argue that you are authentically decentralized, which we want, I want to broach with you in a moment. But in your white paper, you explain that you are the new mining algorithm uh, that, that essentially consumes blocks for other blockchains as part of your mining, you know, computational challenge. So let's talk about that in the context of consensus, uh, consensus algorithms, because you have a unique design in itself with the POD model. Can you tell us a bit about that and how that operates and relates to you know, the success of your plan? It's a great question. There's always some uh, variability here, just like you know the question mm-hmm. in Ethereum whether or not this is going to work. So this isn't a guarantee in any mm-hmm. sense. But we've run lots of simulations and lots of different perspectives on it. But even at, even outside of, or we've taken lots of perspectives on it, even outside of those, this is really Bitcoin, you know, some of the Bitcoin components with Ethereum's speed mm-hmm. in the sense that you can accept multiple kinds of blocks uh, as valid work and merge those in at a future date, you okay. know, making a most uncle-like entity. But the, the important thing to know with the consensus model around the collider is that it's a, uh, a, an improved version of proof of work mm-hmm. at the compute layer. But then at the network layer, we're definitely piggybacking on the ability of other chains to update their own state. Right. So it's like, as soon as one chain might fail to update state in a timely manner, mm-hmm. that's a problem that Block Collider has. But because these chains are actually relatively doing a great job, and one of the reasons that we are controlling the roadmap for the first year in the chains that we add, uh, is to make sure that we add chains that aren't going to in any way uh, decrease the experience of using the collider by having stale blocks or you know forks that cause consensus issues. Right. But in Collider's case, we're also like a greedy. It's it's called a greedy greedy stateful data according to some of these papers. But it's just that the data is always stored. So mm-hmm. regardless, the heights of chains might include the same block references to the same block many times. Right. But those references might actually change. So it could be like ETH block two is this. And it might be two, 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 two. Then it might be, ooh, there's an ETH block 2B. And that is a valid addition to the chain. Mm-hmm. It's just you'll be able to, in the collider, say, only do the thing that's supposed to happen with ETH block 2 when I see five of it. I see. You know, when I see a reference to a period of time, which actually could even happen, which is kind of cool. You could even have it confirm and execute your transaction even for that oh, block that was confirmed in Ethereum. Sorry, I'm just going to find you again. <laughs> there you are. So what's interesting also, my apologies for the screen change, but clearly you've, you've selected specific blockchains you know, as you've broached it for specific reasons, which is exciting. What I found fascinating is that you've included Bitcoin in there, and I wanted to broach that brief, briefly because obviously it's had a very, very colorful history, let's say, with its forked nature, with its many different uh, sort of uh, breakaway projects that have emerged. Uh, so what was the fundamental reasoning why you did select that in, in the context of the others? That is the first time we have ever been asked that question. And that is a, a great... There are two reasons to select it. The first is we still have to consider this a not a store of value necessarily, but a store of state. And in that the condition of Bitcoin makes it a ripe candidate for what is most likely synced in many places and on many nodes. Mm-hmm. Be that like a block explorer, be that you know even old versions of it, there's a lot of variety in the Bitcoin uh, arena and a lot of contests. But through all that noise, Bitcoin has this overarching accessibility that at least in the general public's eye, it's a safer call. Long term, I, I think Bitcoin's going to work its issues out, mm-hmm. and we'll do so because we have to. Right. And 
and there's a serious it's almost like you can't say oh well oops none of that bitcoin stuff you know just ethereum as much as they want to you know it's like right it's, not, it's just not going to play out that way sure so. and also with regard to provability it also has a mainstay position in terms of its success as a proven network for various points let's talk yeah. about that the question mark the elephant in the room with regard to the one the sixth other no doubt we have cardano uh, which is establishing something interesting but more importantly eos is doing some exciting things in the space so clearly Number six is in the works, is in the pipeline. What can Number we six is, uh, mm, actually, uh, we really haven't, yeah, there <laughs> is a number six. It is interesting. Yes, well, we're looking forward to that interesting interesting yeah. release at some point. Now, let's talk about code. Code is king as well, Patrick, as you know. And I'd love to know where you're positioned in terms of, well, you know, how far you've progressed as you're, in your code development, your GitHub, etc. We are, uh, well, we're trying to run our whole thing as if we could design it from the outside. Mm -hmm. Like if we wanted to participate with Block Collider as developers, what would that participation look like? If we want to participate as backers or supporters, what does that support look like? And so in each one of those, in answering each one of those questions, one, the number one thing is always like, at the end of the day, we don't care as long as the tech is perfect and it comes out uh, without speculation. Mm -hmm. and that last part is actually the hardest. So what we, we could of course done this whole thing and I and I opened an ICO in January last year, you know, right. when we first mm -hmm. created this premise. Mm -hmm. And that is what, what companies like Polkadot and, and Cosmos decided to do. That's right. We actually at the time, you know, and we're not competitors with them by the way. That's kind of a the whole space needs to grow. That's right. Not fight. But in, the, in, in those examples, there's still a long way from, uh, from the destination that they originally devised. Mm -hmm. We just decided to be quiet, to mm -hmm. not market at all, to not go to any conferences, and just write code. Mm -hmm. It turns out that's actually pretty effective and it's really efficient. And so only over the past couple of months, which even over the last couple of months, you know, talking to you, it's like we've never, and in your case, it's, it's a perfect philosophical alignment and that mm -hmm. we have never and still won't buy you know an ad we're not going to pay That's for awesome. this force you on anything so it's like our mm. entire community it is such a redeeming part of crypto like it's like there are people who will believe in you and work with you and share it with their friends mm. and you don't have to like force it to anybody They're exactly and that's really and Pat, that fits so perfectly with the premise of blockchain, with the premise of decentralizing the marketplace as well, because it really should be about empowering and franchising information for the people. <clears throat> and that's certainly the premise. And what's interesting right now, specifically this month, there's um, almost a, a switch um, being or a light being switched on in the blockchain, and the light bulb's on with regard to letting the tech speak first. There's many projects now that are going quiet, and they're focusing on the technology and really working in, uh, I guess the building out of the of the code that's certainly what you've been doing on the quiet but let's talk about that a bit more you have been quiet since i noticed the date of your white paper was approximately the beginnings of 2017 so in that respect what have you specifically been doing for that year so all of 20 uh it's been an insane year but uh throughout the entire year it started i guess company-wise it started with a, a fascinating uh, round where we invited cryptocurrency founders mm -hmm. to participate. And we, at the time, were maybe too extremist or too, I mean, that's not the right word, too uh, decentralist. <laughs> Maximist, where are we? I don't know what that is. But we, at the time, were like, we should do something that no names should run forever should be impervious like let's just be satoshi again let's try that whole thing one yeah, more time i like that and you're basically being satoshian I, and i think it's like that's cool instead uh well a all the, the founders and whatnot thought that was awesome and and especially since our premise is like let's just make everybody work together and the whole ecosystem move faster right nobody's gonna say no to that option the issue uh, with our original company, which at the time was called Status RSK, mm -hmm. A, it was bad marketing, but I actually really like Sergio's RSK project, and we were going to use RSK as a root store value, which right. is Status of RSK, 
fit. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think through like the marketing implications of like, it's the status of RSK. Mm -hmm. And so people were taking that as if, like somehow, were we a part of RSK, were we not? And then this like, who are the founders at the time turned it into like this weird, uh, uh, I mean, like you guys are you guys are the worst. You're a, yeah. you're a fake, a fraud, a farce, and it's like okay, well. And what's shit. interesting too, and what's interesting too, Pat, is that often there's that injection of sentiment in the marketplace too, and sometimes there's a misalignment with the project and the sentiment. And in this case, it's a perfect example of you know the misnomer builds, and then therefore uh, it, essentially it really just affects the quality of the the project. So so, so, so you so you moved away from that and you know redirected your focus. Yeah, well, the other thing that was interesting with that is like it became very clear that the technology that was important for the ecosystem mm -hmm. was its ability to interact, not even necessarily this decentralized exchange element, which is what we thought would take precedence. Right. It became clear that the colliding of blocks was the most important. And the reason we chose Collider even as a feature, beyond being the coolest sounding name ever. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like the Collider in the scientific community, the Large Hadron Collider, mm -hmm. it's actually the antithesis to the Manhattan Project. Right. And it was designed as such, which I didn't, you know, I didn't know this as we were exploring the history on one of these. Uh, it was actually at Strange Loop, which is cool. But the the like the Large Hadron Collider itself is this premise of bring scientists from around the world who are passionate about technology, no regional control, no major owner. You know, and in that case, don't even let the U.S. at the time be, be the primary donor. Like, mm -hmm. divide it up so that everyone can be in this. And let's use the discovery of atoms for good. And it's like, that's exactly what we want to try to make the ecosystem again. Mm. Like, we have all these brilliant developers, different chains, different things. And I think the market is causing this riotous conflict that doesn't need to be there. Like, we're a tiny little just minuscule thing on the global FX scale. Mm. Let's just team up and get strong. Yes, and it's interesting you use the, I guess, the reference to atoms because essentially, you know, the success of the atom even itself is when it works in synergy with, you know, like-minded like atoms. So in that respect, yeah. really, you want to build out the community, you want to build out the infrastructure, and you're not averse to uh, other projects doing the same thing. What do you think would be great? So let's talk about your core features as well, Pat, in terms of some of the key things that you, you know, uh, I guess, <clears throat> you stand by, uh, and that is some of them are your low fees, you're going to reach more users arguably, your security is built in, you're recycling your hash power, and you're backwards compatible. Let's talk about those in the context of really what you offer. Got it. So, Blocklighter is bringing to the table this premise of uh, more and increased levels of accessibility when interacting with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. What that means at a, in a more simple sense is there are there's a little bit of something for everyone mm -hmm. at multiple economies of scale. And it was designed to be this way. So we're, we haven't been bringing this up because it is a complex part, but obviously you're a complex person and, and your interview is already, <laughs> so hey, went all the way down. Bring it's it on, fault. let's do it, yeah, <laughs> let's dig deep. We're, we're a blockchain that you can mine the transactions and the blocks. Okay. So the transactions have this optional element where if you discover an optimization on it, you can make the transaction more attractive and more easily placeable in a block. The right. score that limits a block's size of transactions can be mined in or improved into transactions themselves. I see. And that is one example of, okay, there's a centralization thing that we need to oppose. We understand that. and believe in that as a vision. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, in the opposition of centralization, that isn't mob rule. <laughs> that also isn't a good model. Right. It's everyone where they're at can make decisions and maybe use small parts of this to their benefit. And so it just expands the scale. You can have a little tiny computer, you can have a cell phone connected to the network, mining transactions, and occasionally pick up transaction mining from peers who are nearby you. You're just more likely to find the transaction first and find the right solution. And a transaction doesn't need to be mined, so you as a user mm -hmm. send it in the network, it can be submitted with traditional fees, and you're done. 
But if you pre-mine that or you send it around to others and they mine it, they can make it more attractive, so speed up your transactions processing time, and they can you can decrease some of the fee and reward payout system to mining block you know miners who mine blocks only. I see. So essentially, you're also incentivizing in a more a greater scale by having that dual structure, uh, nice. which is cool. Yes. And if we talk about that in the context of your low latency and your higher throughput, obviously they're key features. Let's let's go there. Nice. So you're yeah, that's on the transaction side. If we think about it in terms of network, that's what's coming next as a bottle as a bottleneck. Right. And when we look at like yes, we will figure out how to parallelize the computation of smart contracts, and mm -hmm. there are already chains working on that premise, like cough cough Zilliqa. Yes, you know, that's true. Oh, and certainly on chain as well. Yeah, and Zen Protocol too. Like yes. those guys, everybody's nice. So everyone's aware of the optimization opportunity here. Right. But then next up is, is network. Mm -hmm. And so how do you create a method that increases throughput by expanding the size of the actual footprint of the network? Right. And in that case, it's like, okay, we create a, a method that makes it so that when you find your best solution in a transaction, you become incentivized to get that transaction everywhere, even if you're not the miner. Right. And that's a huge right. problem right now in Bitcoin and Ethereum and the big players. Like, you have these nodes coming up that have no incentive to relay blocks. They're just trying to sync a chain or send a transaction or get a state change or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And in each one of those models, you're also exposing yourself to this lack of a lack of a. It's you're not even exposing. It's more like there's this opportunity that's being lost. Right. Exactly. All this network speed that's used for no good, like right. it's benefiting no one, that's being withdrawn from a peer who's giving you blocks, mm -hmm. you know, out of the openness of the network. So they're not they're not capitalizing on what they can do. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. If we could talk about now something quite complex, and I apologize, we are going to dig a bit deeper. You have an interesting protocol in your design called the FIX protocol. Obviously, it's your financial information exchange protocol. It has two key functions. Let's talk about them in the context of your collider mining, the internal and the external, and what essentially is the FIX protocol for? Okay, great question. Again, you're hitting all the ones I've never been asked before. <laughs> right. so FIX, FIX is a fantastic uh, method to say hello to Wall Street, mm -hmm. and that—that that is, uh, it's even if you Google like fixed blockchain, you will find articles in news sources where where authors just wonder like why? I mean, just make it easier. Like why don't why don't blockchains build in fixed functionality? And we think that it should be native. Like you should add it to all blockchains. Right. The premise behind adding fixed has to do with our three flagship uh, example, so or three flagship example applications. One is a decentralized exchange, and we're just a demo of like really interesting exchange. Two is really interesting stablecoin, mm -hmm. and three is a financial services offering, which caters to dark pools, OTC tables, and basically liquidity providers. Right. For withdrawing data from FIX, so getting a live price feed of swaps that are occurring between the exchanges that go on in the, in the collider itself, but also being able to submit orders in a way that they're totally used to. So. When you normally sit down in your turret, open up your Bloomberg terminal, whatever it is, as a trader, you can select any block collider node, delete the API endpoint that said NASDAQ before, right. and paste the block collider node address. And now you're getting the same charts, the same live order book feed that you were used to, wow. but now populating your own you know, trading table. So the, the friendliness here is like uh, greatly increased, but the barrier to entry for understanding the system is decreased. And that's all we're trying to like, this highly speculative large move market mm -hmm. can be ironed out by increasing awareness through education. Interesting, so, and you're also, yeah. and Pat, sorry to interrupt, but you're also reducing the complexity, you know, because it's obviously a tough market for people to come in and understand if they're from, from a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a lay position, perhaps they don't have the time, they're time poor, you're providing with a, a better entry point to go and I suppose actualized experience on the blockchain. But let's talk about that in the context, because obviously there are allusions to uh, applications in the enterprise institutional space. And no doubt we're moving into that uh, capacity with scalability increasing. So what's your vision there with regard to you know, connections with enterprise? Oh man, that is my favorite. Uh, enterprise is 
not evil. It's definitely not. Right? Oh, I'm glad you, but there's this aura of like big business is evil. Big business is not evil. Uh, big inefficiencies are evil. And that is often found in big businesses, so maybe the brand sometimes works. Mm -hmm. But what is what I think we're going to start seeing is the separation of businesses from private chains. Those are ridiculous. It's uh, nothing. It's the databases. Yeah, the databases with like a schema attraction to it. You know, so I get like people will work with you because you have to use the weird, you know, reverse hex format to go ahead and you know. Right. Story. Yeah. Exactly. But in that, there's nothing going on here. Yeah. And we might see some major breaks, you know, some mm -hmm. R3, like someone just rewrote a double spend and then JP Morgan's a little pissed about this. But yes. also JP Morgan is not it's not like they're fools, although the media would be it's like fun. Mm. People with jobs, careers, kids, life, family, and they look at them and say, hey, wait a second, somebody can just rewrite this transaction. Right. I might put a hundred million dollars in, in any sort of liquidity pool, and that's a pittance. And what I need to move through here. So we'll start to see a in a conglomeration around scaling options that cater towards uh, the exploration of private, privately controlled or fearless environments. Mm -hmm. And a fearless environment might look like something uh, of a DAG, okay. which could be you know, a hierarchy of certificates or permission system. But I think in the Collider's case, we'd love a I, I, we would love someone to fork our technology on day one, okay. run a different version, explore another avenue. Like this is educational. Maybe we got the settings wrong, tweak them all, run block collider cash. Maybe, sure. Maybe and, and technically they could. And they, sh yeah, they could totally. I mean, like that's, that's one of those like, yep, do it. Mm -hmm. But then what could be interesting here is what if we did create colliders of combinations of, of coins that were like all KYC approved or right. all regionally approved? And in doing so, we give some power back to a regulatory authority in that the, the regulatory authority would run the collider and own the collider's chain. But they're not necessarily owning the individual chain's properties. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting. You'd have this like collider that is something they can rewrite and double spend. Right. But they can't rewrite and double spend the blocks that were used to actually create the proof. I see. Which is... So essentially, cool. it, essentially, awesome. it's, it's much like the tree. The tree doesn't change. It's already grown and you're providing a seed. And that seed can then be used in that sense. So it's interesting that you know, you're optimistic about that application in the enterprise space. Uh, right now, we're seeing banking as a huge industry in its own. Uh, it, obviously, with, with regard to partners even, you know, no doubt you're thinking in that direction as well. Very much so. Okay, let's talk I more about that. Well, we can't really go into anything on, on without, specific... without naming names. What have you been doing? Uh, well, well, let's just say that it is very attractive for a company to be able to expose themselves to crypto with one interface. Right. So they can right. interact with many of them at once and come back. And so, positioning ourselves as a um, as an API interface mm -hmm. almost is really effective. It seems a very productive way of going about this. The other perspective that we're seeing from a partnership standpoint is this uh, correlation between price instability and the announcement of terrible partnerships right. from chains. And I think it's just kind of a, a bad side effect of not following a traditional four, you know, four K model where you're submitting the SEC these filings. Exactly. And eventually, I think we'll have something around you know filings like Masari uh, is coming out soon, and, mm -hmm. and that's. One of those things where, yeah, we'll see more more standardization of those. But until then, our goal is actually to do really no announcements of partnerships mm -hmm. in the near future until we have a more traditional model. And that actually makes partners even more willing to go much, much farther. Sure. So there's, and, and obviously... In, in having that approach as well, Pat, you're not trying to hype the market, which we've seen you know, have quite disastrous effects, even on those specific projects, because we see essentially a pump and dump model. It's quite, quite, it really does disaffect also the consumer. So we do respect, or I sincerely do, your approach to a much more you know, steady approach. Because, you know, as they say, the tortoise will win the race in that, you know, by being slow and steady and being respectful, I suppose, of the tech and, and what, as you roll out as a functional entity in the space. Let's talk about your team now, Pat, as well. You've got an impressive one uh, with regard to experience. 
I did I did notice as I read through that uh, you haven't focused so much on you know the the PhD level academic hardcore uh, elements, and I wanted to talk to you about that in with, with respect to why, because we see a lot of uh, that as a selling point essentially. So you've gone for experience, you've gone for grassroots understanding of the project. So the team. Well, so there's two parts. The, uh, the team is the best people I've ever worked with in my life, and that includes you know not to rat on that, but it's like these I. These are, whether or not they stand out on paper, you talk to them for two minutes and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's like, I am, and I truly believe this, the weakest part of this team. Like, these guys are are great people. I, I You know, for them, it's like, this is, uh, this is how I would want the Avengers to look like, to bring back some justice. But there is a, uh, there's a, a, a lack of academic focus there's a lack of PhD focus, and I'm not sure why that is. These are the kinds of people that, that want to work on this this project. Mm-hmm. We are close with a lot of you know the PhD space and a lot of the academic space, mm-hmm. and we're working with you know even scientists at CERN, which we think is kind of fun because like mm-hmm. there's this collider collider parent collider child collider element. Right. But especially from the team level, we also try to price in our inexperience as well. Being the only antithesis to this is that, let's say that this team not having, let's say that PhD equates to always finding the best solution, sure. which didn't go to college, so we can't really do that, but we can't also claim that we're Vitalik. That's like sure. illogical. Well, so, Vitalik did drop out, let's be, let's be real about that too. True, and so then that shows that he could go to college, but also does not have the wherewithal to remain at it. <laughs> or, or, or more, in, more, more to the point, like you guys, he wanted to do something different. You know, yeah. it wasn't a marker of his intelligence. And and I'm not saying that either option is a better option, having many PhDs or not. Sure. What I think is a is it the right way to do this is to price yourself fairly. It's like if we're a rock star, all star team then you see these valuations that may not reflect the technology that's being brought to the table in this right. current market. Right. We wouldn't accept those. Like Block Collider, we were, I don't know, 21 times oversubscribed. Not, we can take way more than we would ever take. Okay, that's we're, impressive. 21 times. I don't think I've ever heard that number quite so high, yeah, honestly. It's, it's, small. Uh, it's a kind of an interesting, it's a great place to be in. It's probably just because of the small market cap. You know, there's a speculative wave here, and we're going to get rid of those too. Right. Uh, but there. But outside of that, back to team advisors. That's the other negative thing we've seen in this space. Is like yes, we have we have amazing investors, and we talk to them all the time. And it's one of those things where, and I would never. Uh, I'm not going to say that I'm cool because I hang out with the cool guy, and then try to like make you price in me or the technology because the cool guy said it. Exactly. And it's like, how many Bitcoin specialists worked on Ethereum? Exactly. Like, you've, got, you've got a WordPress, two kids who ran a WordPress blog, who one of them graduated college, but that was it. The other one didn't. And I mean, it's like, that is the differential thinking that Ethereum was. We need to not like ignore block letter, get them out of that. Like, let's just drop all that. Mm. Let's make some more Ethereum. It's like, why not do that again? Mm. Even if it isn't us, let's put more people on really aggressive out there projects, especially when the market buoys, you know, any project. And mm. it's like, why boost old tech? And, and to be honest, it's nice and refreshing to hear the kind of confidence in you, that you're speaking of. And the reason why I say that is because obviously I speak to a lot of CEOs and right now the sentiment is often unique by design in comparison to traditional markets because we have this uh, interim phase right now as we emerge as an infrastructural design whereby often the sentiment dictates a, a stake in the evolution, the iterations of the, of the company itself. What you're saying is quite confident. You're saying, you know what? Let the tech talk. Let the let the project be what it is, and and harp back in many ways to what we've seen in traditional marketplaces, whereby the you know the influencer or the advisor in this case did not have a role, did not actually exist so much. That's that's actually a fantastic point. The transition to an infrastructure based system that's interesting. I haven't thought of it that way, but yeah, I agree. I think that is the shift that we're starting to see well, happen. I, I, I can say I appreciate your confidence as well. It's it's exciting to hear. If we could talk about now your emblems, just to digress into something a little bit more technological, we haven't broached that. It's very important to design. What are they? And 
you know, why are they important? So emblems are interesting because there's this, there's, there's people who have tokens and there are people who have coins and emblems are not either one of those. Right. And it's hard to explain them then because they do this weird thing that other things cannot do based on some of the technology that's built into the collider. And emblems themselves, there's this like, okay, what are your pre-sale bonuses? Like how many this, and outside of being outside of our philosophy, I'm not ever going to give a free emblem away ever. <laughs> it's, we're never ever going yeah. to do that. Right. An emblem is a fixed supply instrument. It's like knowing exactly how much gold there is on earth. Why would we ever allocate <laughs> unnecessarily emblems? And so emblems in a, in a, market sense are interesting because they are an in interesting instrument to see what happens. I see. But then in a applied sense, emblems have this uh, logarithmically decaying function that if your miner, well mining a block, mm -hmm. mines with a balance of emblems, they can inject transactions, more transactions relatively to that block. Right. And so as you increase the emblem balance, each emblem becomes less valuable to the amount of additional transaction space you get. Mm -hmm. But then you have something that I cannot wait to see, which is dynamically adjusting block sizes based on the either the market's willingness to price in emblems themselves or miners' willingness to price fees at whatever the market rate is. So just like transactions expands the uh, the levels of it, the economies of scale that are possible mm -hmm. in the collider from a, from a hardware investment perspective, you know, mining hardware and whatnot. Emblems allow you to expand the economies of scale from almost like a fee-based perspective. It adds another layer to keep fees from being the only metric that organize the priority of transactions. I see. And that's what it's here. It's like that shouldn't be the only thing that impacts them because – Unfortunately, size is directly correlated to throughput on the network. Exactly. So that eventually won't be the answer to pricing transactions. So we're adding this emblem score to additionally price indirectly what a transaction's fee model should be. And what's interesting too is that <clears throat> you're doing things that I've, I've certainly not read about before. You're quite innovative. Would you argue that some of the things that you're putting forward in your plan uh, simply haven't been done or are being done to your knowledge? I I don't know. I think every project says that, but I think that also mm -hmm. gives us undue credit. Absolutely nothing nothing that we've seen is doing things like this. Yes, I would However, agree. We are definitely standing on the shoulders of giants, and I've been mm -hmm. doing that my whole life. So and, it isn't like And Pat, no doubt that's going to happen with other projects that emerge uh, subsequent to you. You know, they're going to be standing on, on top of your, your shoulders as a giant in the space, arguably, or hopefully for you. If we could talk about now, you you. I guess, some of the iterations of development with regard to your app lab, your smash lab, and your wallet. You've done your research. <laughs> <laughs> it's about everything. <laughs> well, I think these three things really stand out, to be honest. I mean, you've yeah, done a lot yeah. of work on the, these three areas. So the, the interesting element with wallets is we believe that they're actually a barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. And when you're explaining it to a new individual, they actually understand mining before they understand wallets. Right. And mining become this useful instrument for educating people in general on how blockchain works. Mm -hmm. But then when you introduce this wallet, like there's this weird to them, scary look. I think hashes are beautiful because they line up, but right. it's a scary looking thing. And eh, maybe, maybe there's a better, more friendly way to do it. Right. And so our concept with the wallet, the block lighter's wallet is like, Let's, let's drop some of the negative aura around these interfaces and create a voice-based one. Mm -hmm. So with the Collider's wallet, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, we have not opened it on the App Store yet from a... Yet. So you can't test it today. Yet. But it is a remarkable experience. Yeah. So, so you like really software. like the interface as well as what you're saying in the way in which it's designed. Ah, this is the way... I don't know. This is the way I'm not the true, you know, the mastermind behind that is all Arjun, my mm -hmm. co-founder. He's, you know, from birth to incubation. Like he's created, he's basically the new Vitalik. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, That's a big call. He's, well, he's like, yeah, I mean, hopefully you guys will connect to Yeah, that. that'd be awesome. Arjun's, the wallet, long story short, is I can say, go ahead and transfer my assets out of this into something else. 
And your mom's like, cool, done. Wow. And you're like, well, that's, this is nice. <laughs> nice and smooth, nice and seamless by the sound of it. Well, we're excited to hear about that further as we see it unfold with demos. And, you know, as you said, you're very careful in, in terms of what you release and when you release it. And re, re, I respect that. Let's talk about now your app lab and, oh, yep, in, in, as well. So App Lab and Smash Lab. Mm. Smash Lab is our experimental plane, actually to try to attract more innovation in the distance class of algorithms. Right. So uh, Smash Lab is where you can play with um, varying kinds of distance algorithms that aren't the one that we ended up selecting okay. in the collider. And that is our, our way, again, of inviting variations of the collider to exist, new you know ideas to come out of that, where we aren't saying we found the best, Someone else found another way to play this strange way to merge data. Mm. Go, and Smash Lab is our way of encouraging that. Okay. App Lab is our, our way of also encouraging development or developer participation, but on a uh, more traditional example template. You know, here's a guide, here's a tutorial, here's an app where you can out of the box run a really in, like our, our decentralized exchange example is like mm -hmm. out of the box it can wrap an old ethereum decentralized exchange with the ability to swap uh bitcoin for any of your tokens right and it's, and it's just like it's like 12 lines of our upgraded bitcoin op codes and it's it's really nice it's just copy paste and now you have this new type of contract that's running on the collider that takes uh that allows you to swap assets Right, like and, and what's interesting also, Patrick, about your design, and you don't often hear this, to be honest, in, in the projects that, that I engage with, even at the best of blockchain, is that you're really a proponent of the, the plastic nature of your own project in the sense that you're, you're not confined by, or restrained by the designs that you've set forth in, on paper or even right now, but you're really you're planning on being some sort of dynamic and evolutionary design where you're open to the inclusion of new in, in, new innovations, not just from your own team. So that's, that's yeah. quite rare, and it's quite realistic, I would argue. We also are looking at this from a super collider perspective. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, I might be, it's like, we haven't actually talked about this yet, but it's like, so a super collider, right, is this uh, theoretical in, in scientific space mm -hmm. where you have this additional collider, either adding more particles to the stream or more combinations but you figured out a, you figured out a combination that you liked, so right. then you create this super collider that's like, okay, now let's take more combinations and combine those. Mm. What if people find this awesome variation, this great combination that provides like maximum synthetic assets or something like that, mm. we could actually just add those into the original collider, so like the collider could mine itself. Right. And it's this weird thought of like, mm. uh, you could we could extend it to take the other collider's chain that's doing really well mm -hmm. and add it into our own. And so then you end up with this portfolio of a, you could take a super collider that has collider A, B, C, D, E, F in it, all running at the same time, all with sub colliders separately mined and independent from each other, but it's exposed to every one of those child contract systems. Sounds, a, sounds, sounds plausible at the very least. And what I did want to, a perfect segue, I have to say, nice work nice. there, because I wanted to ask you with regard to universities. Obviously, some of the best blockchain projects are engaging with universities at some point to develop labs. Given this kind of ambition and given it, it's entirely plausible, are you planning on engaging at that level with you know, blockchain experts to really you know, develop the conversation of these kind of super, super clusters and these super colliders? Absolutely. I hope that there'll be some academic interest inherently because of our almost our like riotous perspective and that I think we align well with that time of life. Right. <laughs> then uh, there is an element here of, of structured university access that from a colliders perspective, it's a core part of our strategy. Mm -hmm. We haven't laid out exactly how that will play from a, you know, how, how we actually want to do this, especially since it isn't clear regionally where our our growth center will end up being. I see. We still I... need to be adopted almost. And it's like you have this original, oh, the NEO is the Ethereum of China. Right. But in what happens, you know, it's like they're being adopted by the city of Zion pool of developers in that area, and that's really where they are. Exactly. And the collider, you know, needs that. But once that, that is more established, then we spread out. And that, you know, then it's like every university – Let's do grants, let's do in-classroom sessions, you know, let's bring 
iPads and excitement and get people reading about it and thinking about it and breaking it. You know, awesome. let's do black ops tournaments. I really want to do those. <laughs> so let's hope that, <laughs> let's bring on the hackathons, bring on Berkeley, bring on Princeton, bring on Harvard. Looking forward to yeah. hearing about that. Let's move across now again back to the tech. A smart contracts, an exciting, you know, event that happened on the blockchain, you know, as of Ethereum's so let's talk about that in the cross-chain sense. Interoperability is your big thing. Um, so with regard to cross-chain con contract hedging, what are you doing there to ensure that third parties are part of the space? To, in I, I don't. I hope that what we see is is less contract, less contract or cross-chain contract hedging, because we're able to increase the liquidity in the space. Mm -hmm. And that's not a guarantee that anyone can make at any time. And liquidity can leave. You know, it's a it's like a it's a delicate dating situation. Sure. A broker in liquidity. Sure. But uh, which even then most brokers would probably crush me for comparing to that. It's much harder. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But like there, so net net is in the event that a ARB opportunity opens up. That's also exposing a weakness in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And while the ARB opportunity generally plays out, mm -hmm. our goal in the near future is to develop protocol upgrades as we and we have six planned forks, you know, planned hard fork events. Right. And in during those events, it's like one of the actually two of the primary channels in the roadmap, which we also haven't publicly released yet, but that's because the roadmap introduces a lot of complexity. Okay. But uh, the roadmap itself one of the core objectives is, okay, when we are looking at ARB, uh, pump dump, price cartels, huge um, volume spikes and then volume barren or barren volume landscapes, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, mm -hmm. we need to figure out what caused it, what, game, what fell apart in our own game theoretic model that enabled that sort of thing to happen. Was it an application layer problem? Was it perfect? You know, it's like, this is a constant discussion in each wave of our release cycle. Right. And I think we can hopefully use our to actually teach us, you know, rather than kind of, you know, fight them. Like, the, I don't know how, but IEX, the market that slows everything down. Right. Okay. Not familiar, but. Uh, it's just like they they wrap the coil around. Now you have to sit there for like a minute and let your transaction spin around this coil. Okay. And they're very proud of the coil. They like show everyone the coil. It's like this giant copper coil. And okay, cool. But then the answer is make it more inefficient. Mm -hmm. Like, no, something's is, wrong with the opposite of what market. you want to do. Right. So obviously, you know, you want to try and build out the infrastructure. You want to make sure that your con smart contracts is strong. The, the relationship between all of the different uh, blockchains is strong. Uh, inter inter interoperability feature is going to be the cornerstone of what you stand for uh, in terms of how you roll out. But let's talk about the the fundamental, you know, something that many people have been waiting for to talk about, and that is your token, you know, your utility aspect, how the fuel that, that runs the engine. So in that respect, can you talk us through, uh, you know, what you can of the token itself in terms of its tokenomic value, in terms of its distribution as well? So there are two... Uh main things going on in the collider and they could be compared to the ecosystem effects we've seen with neo yeah so we have this neo instrument and then we have gas instrument in the collider we have this emblem instrument and then we have energy instrument the difference is in neo you just you uh hold it and you're paid in gas right so one is the, the in near to clarify one is the governance one is the utility and you just to be clear you have the nrg and you have the EBM. Yeah, or EMB. Oh, sorry, my but, apologies. Yeah. EMB, yeah, for emblem. Some ICO sites, which we also have never listed on a site. They list, they list this of their own volition. But yes, right. Okay. They still been doing EBM, which is, I don't want an EBM. It's EMB. My apologies. So EMB. I just know where you're going. Yeah, it's just I read it somewhere like that. Eb none. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you got these anyway, two. Yes. So what do they stand for? You know, Ineo has their own. You have yours. Yeah, so there's there's a really interesting situation going on here because in the ICO is giving a user accessible access to the emblem thing, mm -hmm. but not any, not a single drop of energy in this uh, situation. Right. And energy is mined all, all of it from the beginning zero to nine point eight billion, which is when the last rewards cycle. Uh, closes 
And it's mined in a tradition like it's issued per block, it's rewarded to the miner who won it, and it is required to power everything that goes on the collider. So as you want to interact with it, you don't use emblems. You can't redeem your emblems to execute transaction. Emblems are this ability to get more energy relative to your hardware investment. And so then it becomes, we're, we're thinking something of like the stability instrument, mm-hmm. you know, in a situation where we want emblems to, uh, to be less volatile because you have miners who are just interested in like, yep, we just sit on our, you know, whatever, 30,000 emblems and we just sit on it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then energy to be all over the place. Mm-hmm. And energy is required when you uh, stake a transaction, when you lease, when you execute a sub-transaction, when you're executing the new opcodes, mm-hmm. it's the new form of incentivization. I see. So essentially the NRG is in many ways your online currency. It's your online fuel that's going to really fuel the, the in-house economy. And then you have the bedrock uh, aspect of the EMB, which is amazing. And that's you know. in NEO's eyes, you could sit there with NEO and do nothing for NEO. Mm. just holding right but emblems you can sit there with emblems and you will get nothing in return (laughs) you also have to invest in the mining infrastructure and hardware and network uh infrastructure to gain any benefit so you've got to do the work which we like about you you like making sure that not only your team are at work and they they really illustrate their value through what they're doing but it's the same for it's the same for the users in the in in the project for the, yes, sir. Uh, with, with, with regard to the utility. Uh, let's talk about now your, your token supply. Let's talk about the tokenomics of our aspect. I know it's not your favorite subject, but many people do want to know about it. So how many tokens, you know, in the context of these, this dual design? And, you know, what's happening with your ICO? What you can tell us? Well, we, the ICO is a, all right, so token economics, mm. there are 300 million emblems ever in existence. Okay. Eventually, they will, which luckily, right, as emblems are lost through usage, which is a normal thing, right? Lost wallets, lost whatever. Sure. We're also you're seeing a decrease in the supply output reward rate of energy mm-hmm. as your rewards decrease. So there's this good uh, uh, good swap between the two as they eventually will intersect in like this happy medium of right amount of energy for right amount of emblems, and that's where we want to see a. Uh, the fees stabilize, equalize, so that you can mine forever, just gaining fees from sure. transactions in your own supply. But then at a token metric level, the ICO will be offering 100 million of them flat. Right. And the 100 million is divided up at a price of seven cents per. Mm-hmm. And seven cents is a flat rate for anyone in our uh, private institutional round, mm-hmm. which is where we went to key strategic venture funds and uh, like board members of things that are useful to be board members of. Mm. And, and essentially there on that note is a value add companies because often in the past we've seen strategic partners that aren't necessarily so strategic but clearly in your case you're focused on those at that level that will really value add to your project. Yep. To prove it you'll also notice there are no logos, no advisors, no. Mm-hmm. And if we did drop those logos like I get it that that would probably boost some confidence. But does it boost confidence from the right people? Right. I don't think so. Right. I wouldn't allocate confidence because I saw these lo- logos. I'd allocate confidence because the technology is good. Mm-hmm. So it's just people who seek technology as a confidence builder to mm-hmm. be the people who originally support Block Collider. Absolutely. So or, or, organic growth is what you're specifically looking for. That's cool. Yeah. So let's go back into it. So you've got 100 mil, as you talked about, as the, the final amount. Seven cents a pump, which puts us at a market cap of 21 million in mm-hmm. estimate. That still maintains that 70, uh, 76 percent or 70, uh, yeah, three, yeah, 76 percent is in control of both the team and the foundation. I see. The team itself is 29 percent. Not all of that has been allocated at all, but we're that's future proofing strategy. Sure. Which also keeping raising seven million, we need to find another way to to pay people sure. very quickly. Right. And so emblem ownership is a very big part of participation at the collider level, which fortunately is also a good signal for how dedicated someone is, mm-hmm. right? If you, don't, if you want to just get a fat paycheck, go to, you know, go to another place. To, 
Got you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad that, I'm glad that cut out that yeah. point. So I think yeah, it's that, really, yeah, yeah, I cut that. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, also, yeah. Pat, I wanted to ask you, with regard to the design itself, obviously, you know, the tokenomics look really good from the standpoint of someone perhaps looking at it in com comparatively to other projects. No doubt in your design you want it to be, you want to be positioned so that you can be uh, attractive in this space right now. But your premise essentially is really the utility. Of uh, them, yeah. I mean, that's... There's no reason to have them mm. except for participating. Well, the reason so, why I ask is because obviously there are there's a securitization happening of some blockchain projects right now in the space of the SEC also. So, you know, in that respect, given that you are about to do ICO, how are you feeling about the recent climate and, and the propensity for the for uh, you know reticence at the very least? I have been shocking. I have been totally wronged. Wronged in the sense that I was completely wrong about my perspective of how the SEC, what role they want to play, mm. who they are. At this point, I am increasingly not only confident, but like appreciative for the services that they provide while also being framed as the bad guy. And it's this weird, like, I'm not sure that we've read the SEC correctly, or I know that we have not, but just like, you know, is Roger Ver as crazy as he seems? Maybe. But there are some, like, he's not the evil villain of the West. Like, he's got some cool ideas. Right. And SEC is also, they, they don't get as much credit as they deserve. So to answer your question, mm. there is totally an exposure to risk there. Mm -hmm. And we need, we need to prepare for that, which is why Block Lighter is a foundation and an Anstalt based in, based in Liechtenstein. Right. Where it operates, uh, not without, you know, lawful reach but i think that's also important for anyone participating is it is exposed to you know the u.s can get anywhere but it, right. it is exposed to that sort of thing and um, but there's also this there are layers to in the event that the environment becomes partition becomes unexpectedly negative despite the trends of positivity that we're starting to see the underlying current of the united states is always good at, and we actually had a great conversation with we this. Did. With, yeah, we did. And it's like they're good at, at finding valuable uh, things and maybe not uh, and remaining open to them mm -hmm. and and then leveraging them. And hopefully that ends up with uh, more of an Australian perspective, you know, which yes. is – Yes. There's some answers as it covered that we need to. And, what, and what's exciting also is that innately, you know, what we're talking about is opportunism, you know, at the very least, is, and the capitalism aspect that, you know, you're renowned for as a, as a country. You know, you see a great idea and you really go hard on it. So in this respect, no doubt blockchain is one of those things, but how we how that plays out is going to be interesting. So it's, it's great to hear your insight. You're not worried, clearly, from your response. But once again, if we go back to the ICO for a moment, let's talk about dates. You don't like talking about specific dates because of, you know, the disclosed reason of maintaining the non-hype approach. But when is it happening? We did create this storm around then trying to get a registration slot. And so we've now, uh, we've had one, we had two planned registration events. One was for our Telegram users, you know, people from the very mm -hmm. start to participate and, and get in. And we had to close that in two two minutes because it broke through our the total number of registrations that we had allowed to be allocated wow. uh, ever. So then we froze that. It turned out we had more space for the initial batch based on median averages that we could take between the ranges that people are asking for. Mm -hmm. uh, so we opened up a second round that evening and again, just astronomic efforts on this. So this is our final event. We will be clearing out every other registration slot that we have available. Mm -hmm. And after that, we will announce the formal ICO date, which looks to be uh, March 28th. Okay. So. Looks to be. That's pretty specific. So March 28th. Yeah. And I appreciate that as well, Pat. Thank you so much for just disclosing some of that information when Pat, it's not your style. And I really do. You knew everything else. So. Well, why not? Why not add it to the mix? So, mate. Obviously, you know, you mentioned you alluded to Telegram. It's, it's, I noticed your Telegram has really blown out. It's been hugely popular. If people want to find out more about you, perhaps that don't necessarily know much and they've watched this video, where could they go? Is it solely Telegram? Best place to go is, uh, best place to go is the website, mm -hmm. probably. Um, then it's Telegram. Telegram is going to be a little stormy over the next 
Thelrin is a fascinating social opportunity if you want to see just, you know, some of the, the, the trends dynamic. in questions. Yeah, you, yeah. So if you like that kind of stuff, that's interesting. But there's a element here where asking questions there, we are very proactive in getting to them. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a little like, it's just noisy. There's a lot of people. Sure. It, there's over 8,000 now or something like that. And, and it, that's not much for the mega ones, but that's a lot if you're kind of project where we're answering every question. Like that's our like gotcha. goal. So essentially, if you want to chat, go to Telegram. If you want to find out the facts, go to the website. And just with regard to future direction as well, Pat, no doubt you have some plans. You haven't disclosed all the roadmap, and we'll have a look as, as you unfold as a very exciting blockchain uh, architecture. But as one of the co-founders, you have a clear plan in your mind of exactly what you want to do. What are two or three things you want to broach right now that you're excited about in your future direction? Really stand out. 2018, bring it on. Well, wow, that is great. Yeah, you're really putting on that. What yeah. about, you know, things like mainnet releases, things like that just excite you that are coming coming up? Well, it just, it turns out that proof of distance is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And that's, it turns out that is part of a, that is a, we are not done with that strategy. Mm -hmm. And that strategy is just beginning. Okay. And so I encourage people to continue to dive into what this thing is going to do, mm -hmm. because it's, it's really interesting. And maybe that'll be round two of our, of our phase two of block collaboration. I hope so. I hope so. And we'll yeah. connect then. So Patrick McConlog, it's been an absolute honor. You have provided more than expected with regard to trying to inform us about Block Collider. It's, it's certainly a very exciting, innovative project, doing things that simply many blockchains aren't doing right now. And you're fundamentally interoperating. You're connecting blockchains to blockchains and doing it in a way that is, is, has real use case and real applications, not just for consumers, but for enterprise as well. So once again, on behalf of us all, thank you so much for being here today. And um, hopefully we can talk again soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thanks a lot. Thanks no a lot. No worries.